Hey guys, so today I am going to talk about Soren Markov. He is one of the oldest living planeswalkers. He has the title Lord of Innistrad, even though he spends very little of his time actually on the plane of Innistrad. Most of his days he spends roaming around the multiverse, because he's lived for so long that everything bores him. He travels from world to world trying to satiate his hunger for something interesting. Even though Soren isn't always on Innistrad, that doesn't mean he doesn't keep an eye on it. He feels a personal responsibility for his home plane. So in order to understand why Soren Markov feels a deep down responsibility to take care of the people of the plane, we have to jump way back in time, like way, way, way back in time to when Soren was a little kid. His grandfather was Edgar Markov, an alchemist living in Stensia. So in this land, there was a horrible famine and families were starving to death. Edgar wanted to help and he desperately searched for a solution, but the solution he derived was rather brutal. His answer was a blood ritual that caused people to feed on blood. Uh, the blood could provide sustenance to people and simultaneously reduce the high demand for failing crops. Thus, vampires were created. Now, Edgar wasn't as altruistic as it first appears. He had some darker motives. He was actually experimenting with ways to achieve agelessness. He was only able to reach the blood feeding solution by taking suggestions from a demon called Shilgengar. Um, the entire ritual made Edgar feel a little squeamish, um, but Shilgengar pushed him to go through with it. So Shilgengar is ultimately responsible for the creation of the blood feeders, even though it is attributed to Edgar Markov. And the famine may have even been caused by Shilgengar. Who knows? I wouldn't be surprised. Thanks to the experiment, Edgar was able to extend his own life, along with the life of his only grandson, Soren. This is how Soren reached his vampiric state. After the ritual, Soren disappeared. The trauma of the transformation had ignited his planeswalker spark. Now, Soren was practically royalty. Not only was he now a planeswalker, but he was the grandson of the honored progenitor of the entire vampiric race. So, during Soren's travels around the multiverse, he began to take notice of some Aetherborn monstrosities that were consuming one plane after another. They were called the Eldrazi. Soren allied with two other planeswalkers, Nahiri and Ugin, to combat these monstrosities. They devised a plan. Nahiri was a core lithomancer, and she was going to force the Eldrazi to take their physical form. Then Soren could use his life-leeching magic, and Ugin, an ageless spirit dragon, would defeat the Eldrazi. Sadly, their plan didn't go as they had hoped. Once the Eldrazi took physical form, Soren was able to weaken them. He was so powerful back then, he literally sapped the life out of these godlike beings to the point where they were no longer able to planeswalk. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough. Together, the three planeswalkers were not powerful enough to actually defeat the Eldrazi. Instead of killing them, Soren lured them onto the plane of Zendikar, where they imprisoned the Eldrazi. Of course, this doomed the plane of Zendikar and all of its inhabitants, but hey, at least it saved the rest of the multiverse. The three planeswalkers agreed to one day return if their ritual was ever disturbed, and then they left the plane. Of course, this isn't where the story ends, but more on that later. So, Soren spent his days traveling once again, always keeping a watch on Innistrad. And he began to notice changes to his homeland. Vampires were spreading further and further into human lands, and they began to dissociate more from the human race that they spawned from. Their hunting of humans became bolder, and their mistreatment more excessive. Vampires were gaining power, and human villages were failing. Soren feared that one day all humans would be wiped out by blood feeders. Soren knew that if humans went extinct, so would the vampires. So he felt it was his responsibility to prevent this from happening. Fun trivia, Soren actually tried to go without eating humans for a while. He made it three days. Of course, he couldn't die from not eating humans because he's a planeswalker and immortal. 
But that being said, the agony was far too unbearable for him to even move, much less live. Soren continued his travels around the multiverse, but it wasn't because he was an eccentric antisocial prince, as most vampires assumed. He was searching the multiverse for a solution to save his home plane. After years, Soren finally returned with a plan, even though his plan would make him appear a traitor to the very people he was attempting to help. Soren borrowed from the long-held beliefs about the moon and the afterlife, and he established a religion to help the humans fight back against the forces of darkness. Soren created a warrior that could help hold the balance between monsters and humans. He named his warrior Abson. She was someone who would fight for the meek and a sustained life on the plane. Through faith, humans could have the power to fight back. The faith he created was actually a series of enchantments and spells that could protect the humans from the werewolf's curse and haunting guys. In addition to Avacyn, Soren created the Hell Vault, a huge, rough, angular monolith that imprisoned supernatural creatures. It is the most holy object on Innistrad besides Avacyn herself. Soren's plan was a success. The humans, thanks to his assistance, were able to repopulate and his religion flourished, becoming more complex and popular than Soren had ever anticipated. Soren had no intention of staying on Innistrad permanently. So while Soren roamed the multiverse, Avacyn stayed behind as his legacy. He also set up a way to refresh the magic in his absence. He devised a system of wards and spells that, when cast repeatedly, added strength to the overall protective magic of the faith. Avacyn was the focal point of worship. She was a way to encourage humans to say the wards and therefore keep the enchantment strong. Because of Soren and all his work, Innistrad was saved. Even though this meant he betrayed his own vampire brethren for the sake of the plane. Very few vampires understood Soren's intentions. He appeared as a traitor to the entire vampire race. Soren was no longer welcome in Markov Manor, where his grandfather Edgar still resided. On one of Soren's rare visits to Innistrad, he came across an interplanar thief who went by the name of Dak Faden. Dak Faden had stolen a very powerful magical dagger called Ancient Fang. The dagger holds the memories of everyone that has used it. So, thanks to the dagger, Dak Faden found out that Sifa Grant, a planeswalker, was responsible for the death of everyone he had known. Dak Faden came to Innistrad searching for her, and he was stirring up a lot of trouble on the plane, which Soren wasn't too happy about. So, Soren struck a deal with Dak Faden. In exchange for Ancient Fang, Soren let Dak and his friends live for their part in it. Soren destroyed all the notes Sifa Grunt had left behind and told Dak where she came from, in the hope that his problems would take care of each other. Now, back to the Eldrazi. It had been centuries since Soren had helped seal them away, and the Eldrazi were once again free. They had escaped their prison ethereally, but not physically. This meant that they were unable to leave the plane. So instead of leaving, they started to consume Zendikar. Soren could feel the seal weakening, and he returned to Zendikar as was his agreement with the other two planeswalkers. However, they did not show up. Ugin was busy resting in a hedron cocoon after being nearly killed by Nico Bolas. The only reason Ugin was still alive was because of Sarkhan Bol's time traveling. In the original timeline, Ugin was actually dead at this whole time, but I'll explain more of that in a minute. Nico Bolas was eager to see who would answer the call of Ugin after the Eldrazi were freed by Sarkhan Bol, Chase Bellerin, and Chandra Nalar. Soren had no choice but to act. After arriving on Zendikar, he allied himself with Nissa Ravain, an elven planeswalker. But he didn't tell her everything. She didn't know that he was a planeswalker, that he was the one to imprison the Eldrazi in the first place, or that he was even a vampire. He immediately encountered the Eldrazi brood and dismissed them with a simple spell. Soren then liberated the vampiric slave Anowin and demanded that he be taken to the Eye of Ugin. They then traveled to Grey Pelt Refuge and met with Khaled, a merfolk compatriot of Nyssa's. Khaled gave them supplies for their long journey to Akum. He also gave them a piece of the puzzle tower at Tal Terig so that they could find their way. Soren, Nyssa, and Anowin then set off and descended into the McKindy Trench, where they encountered a babbling core woman traveling with a large group of goblins. They shared a campfire with her. 
and were fascinated by her speech. She would only talk in bursts of ancient languages. They learned from the goblins that the woman's name was Smara. She was a witch vessel for his spirit trapped in the crystal she was carrying. They were also on their way to the Eye of Ugin, so Soren suggested that they all travel together. They traveled to the Piston Mountains, and once arriving in Zulaport, they decided to spend the night so they could devise a way to cross the ocean. Unfortunately, a vampiric death was attributed to their group, and they were forced to flee to the sea. Nissa stole a boat and summoned a massive behemoth to swim the ocean and pull the boat along behind it. However, their hasty departure came with some setbacks. There was very little food on the boat and the goblins started disappearing, which made Nissa suspicious. Nissa herself was unable to eat without allowing the behemoth to be dismissed. So, without food or sleep, Nissa was forced to repeat her hard-learned Chiraga fasting mantras in order to survive. It was during this trip that Soren finally revealed to Nyssa the nature of their mission, and he also admitted to being a planeswalker. Soren told Nyssa that the great gods of the past and the progenitors of the brood, the Eldrazi Titans, were bound beneath a comb long ago, and it was his mission to make sure they stay that way. Finally, they approached their destination, but the arrival was not so easy. The bays of Akum were littered with shipwrecks and crystal reefs. On top of this, there was a moon kraken that ruled the waters. Grinolin demanded tribute from their boat, so Soren casually killed one of the remaining goblins to satisfy the great creature. However, the tribute was not satisfactory. Soren then attempted to gain passage by revealing his true nature to Grinolin. The creature remembered Soren and was terrified to see his return, but he would still not let them pass. Nyssa then attempted to use diplomacy. She spoke of Sutina, who had been friends with the Kraken, and she told Grinolin of Sutina's death. The news of his friend's death greatly saddened Grinolin, and discouraged by the return of the brood, he finally agreed to lead them safely through the Crystal Reefs. The group then approached Tal Tereg, where they were surrounded by the brood and captured by elves that Nyssa had never seen before. The elves were the keepers of Aura Andor, and they planned to sacrifice the group so that their Kalia fruits would grow. However, these elves had underestimated the brood, and Aura Andor came under siege. During the confusion, Nyssa, Soren, Anowin, Smara, and a single goblin fled. This goblin went by the name of Mudheel, and he agreed to lead them all the way to the Eye, because his knowledge of Akum was better than Anwin's. But the group had no supplies, and they soon fell to dire straits. They collapsed in the wastelands, but were soon saved by an altruistic water scout who shared his spoils with the group. Anwin then killed the man with Soren's permission, because he needed to satiate his hunger. This left Nyssa aghast. That night, the group was ambushed by an army of gnolls under the direction of two vampires. Nyssa fell during combat and awoke as a prisoner of the vampires. She wondered why they left her alive. They told her that they were hunting the Mortifier. Nyssa mistakenly believed that they were speaking of Anawin. The vampires carried her for several days before her allies came to rescue her. Once rescued, Nyssa approached Anawin about what she had learned, and he told her that she was mistaken. This is when Nyssa finally learned the true extent of Soren's nature. Finally, the group arrived at the Eye of Ugin, but Nyssa's plans had changed from what she had promised. She assumed that the Eldrazi had had so much trouble trying to take over the plane that maybe they'd just give up if they were released. So instead of helping Soren reinforce the spell containing the Eldrazi, she shattered the main hedron and released the enchantment that was imprisoning the titans. She had good intentions. She had believed they would just flee and leave Zendikar far behind, but she was wrong. Soren at this point just gave up with the foolish elf, and he gave up on the plane. A lot of the people here worshipped the Eldrazi as gods, and he's like, well, you worship them, you freed them, you want to die so much, just be my guest. I don't care. And he just left. So at this point, Soren's more worried about his own business. He's done trying to help everyone. It was a huge debacle, a waste of his time. So 
He's gonna focus on his own plane for a little bit. He goes back to Innistrad only to find that Avicen, his creation, had disappeared and history was repeating itself. His home world was devouring itself. The disappearance of the angel Avicen had endangered everyone living there, both the humans and the creatures of the night. Soren's kin, the vampires, were killing humans almost to the point of extinction. Werewolf packs were hunting the priests that were supposed to keep them at bay, and rotting ghouls were mounting a siege on the walls of Thraven, a place where humans were supposed to be sheltered and safe. This was not how Soren had expected things to turn out. The balance he had put in place was completely ruined. With grim determination, he began searching for his lost angel. He slayed anyone who stood in his way. There is plenty of art depicting this. There is one of him impaling someone. It's actually rather cool. His sword actively steals the life of whoever it slays. And there are three different cards of Soren just moving his hand and people turning to dust. Searching for answers, he went to the capital of Gavany and he found it ransacked and there was absolutely no answers for his trouble. During his search, he did come across Tibble, a young planeswalker who seemed like trouble. Tibble opposed authority and Soren knew that if he was left unchecked, he would be a significant threat. By the time Soren dealt with him, he noticed that there were more important concerns on another plane. Soren traveled to the plane of Tarkir, guided by visions of a dark oracle. He was trying to figure out what happened to Ugin and why he didn't appear on Zendikar when the seal was broken. This is part of the story that gets a little bit confusing because there's two different timelines. In the original timeline where Nico Bolas killed Ugin, Soren was aided in his search by an enthralled Temur warrior and he went into Ugin's domain. He then learned that the dragons had gone extinct on Tarkir and that Ugin was dead and his bones were covered by ancient magic. There is beautiful art of this in Concept Tarkir. On the card Bitter Revelation, it shows Soren standing next to Ugin's skull. So in the new timeline that Sarkhan changed, Soren was aided in his search by an enthralled Tarka warrior and he went to Ugin's Hedron cocoon. Soren awakened Ugin from his slumber and informed him of the freed Aldrazi. Ugin thanked Soren and instructed him to find Nahiri, warning him that Ugin does not wish to see your face without hers. This made Soren furious and he left without comment, musing that things were easier when he had only his own world to worry about. Soren returned to Innistrad only to find Markov Manor in ruins. It was twisted into impossible shapes and its inhabitants were embedded in the masonry. Nahiri had left this as a declaration of her vengeance. Soren decided to gather the aid of other vampires and confront her and the threat to Innistrad. This was no easy task, seeing that he was shunned by his own kind. He went to Olivia Voldaren to enlist her help calling in the bloodline. Hence the card Olivia mobilized for war. Fun art trivia. In all of Soren's art up to this point, he is predominantly dressed in leather with little metal armor. In the card art for Soren Grim Nemesis, when he officially goes to war against Nahiri, he is in full plate armor. And it's cool seeing what Soren looks like on the offensive. So Soren went to Olivia and he was told that in order to secure the help of the other vampires, he had to destroy his angel, Avicen. So he goes off to find Avicen, and he arrives just in time to save Chase Bellerin and Tamio from being overcome by Avicen in Thraven Cathedral. Soren saw that Avicen was intent on her destruction, so he politely offered to let her kill them before he had his talk with her. When they did speak, he realized the depths of her madness. Nahiri had turned his most precious creation against him. Even though Soren had told Olivia Valderan he would destroy his angel, he first attempted to reason with her. He wanted to take her down to the cathedral's cellar where he could cleanse her mind of madness. Avicent blamed Soren for what happened, for making her so weak and corruptible. She believed it was his fault that she could be turned against the innocent. She condemned him as Innistrad's greatest evil. 
he created her, so she reasoned that he was responsible for all the evil she committed. Thorin and Avacyn fought. The battle nearly tore the cathedral apart, but in the end, Soren overpowered her, drained her blood, and slammed her body through the chapel floor all the way down to the cellar. He then pleaded with her once again and offered to make her anew and cleanse her mind. Maybe it was because of her madness, or maybe it was because of a personal revelation and a moment of lucidity, but Avacyn refused. She said, If I am not the daughter you want, then we must battle again and again forever, for I will never yield. I am no monster's instrument. I will not be altered by the likes of you. So, 1,000 years after creating Avicen to maintain the balance between humans and the supernatural, Soren was forced to unmake his corrupted guardian in the same spot where she was born. Head bowed with anguished regret, he looked away as he dissipated his progeny into an ashen cloud. With her destruction, the last of his magical protections over Innistrad was broken. Afterwards, Jace tried to speak with Soren about why he had destroyed Avicen. During the conversation, Soren comes to the revelation that this is what Nahiri had wanted all along, and he had accidentally played right into her plan. Soren must be feeling really pissed off right now. Things are just not going his way. He had gone to Zendikar just for Nyssa to release Steeldrazi, which he had no backup to fight because Ugin was off and Nahiri was lost. Then he went to Tarkir to find out that Ugin was dead, and then unfind out because of the events of Fate Reforged. And then Ugin tells him to just go off and find Nahiri. So then he goes off and he finds out Nahiri is this horrible, horrible person who slaughtered his people and corrupted his angel. So then he has to slay his angel, and now he has to go find and stop Nahiri, and it's a whole big mess. Poor Soren. Just trying to help people. He's trying to take care of the vampires and the humans and protect everyone and everyone hates him because he's a traitor to his vampire race and he's just trying to be a good guy. Alright, so I'm going to end with this last little fact. Now it isn't an official fact, but it is accepted by some. It is believed that Soren may have started Zendikar's vampire. Besides the alterations that the Eldrazi made to the vampires on Zendikar, they look exactly the same as Innistrad's vampires. Gray skin, white hair, etc. They also are in vampire families led by a blood chief, the same way Innistrad's families are led by the one who started them. This is a hierarchy rarely seen in Zendikar's native tribes. With the resemblance and the same family structure, it is believed that Zendikar's vampires are descendants of Innistrad's. Of course, a curse that was carried by Soren Margoth. There is card art of Obnixilis killing a native Zendikar vampire, and aside from the outfit and facial tattoos, this vampire looks exactly like Soren Markov. So that's it. That's the story of the perfect anti-hero, Soren Markov, misunderstood vampire who only wants to help save the world. Thank you for watching, um, if you enjoyed, please like or subscribe, I'm going to be doing some more lore videos. I currently have one up on Nico Bolas, so if you're interested, please check that out. Thank you so much and have a great day!